zero to 60, press okay to start. What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. It's been a few days now, I think, since the last episode, but good news, the sky has finally cleared up, and I actually just got this wash yesterday. It's first official wash in California, and man, this thing is looking phenomenal. Super happy I finally washed it because no longer do we have all the dirt that builds up over here after the long, extensive driving. You know what? So after driving this for over 3,000 miles across the country, I've honestly learned a lot about this car, first of which, though, are all about these side splitter wickers. Now, driving on the road, they look cool, right? And I guess they should improve the front downforce. However, though, dirt gets built up down here. The air kind of pushes it up, and it just gets left all around here next to the front headlights, and it wraps around, makes like an a circle effect of dirt wrapping around the wheel arch. And over time, it just really does not look that good. So that's a weird thing about the front side splitter wickers. They really do cause a lot of dirt to be built up on the front fenders. Another really interesting thing about it is that with the 2020 GT500, honestly, I think this is the easiest Shelby that you can possibly drive. And I mean that because, well, Put it simply, you have that DCT automatic transmission. You get inside the car, and the first thing you do is just, you spin that rotary dial gear selector to drive, and you're good to go, you start going. There's no shifting needed whatsoever. It makes it a bit less fun, I think. The first, the first thing I do is I hit that M button right there in the middle, and I think it makes the whole entire experience a bit, a bit more fun, a bit cooler, it's more visceral that way. It's not just easy in that regard, but also the front end, it is way higher than the Shelby GT350R I have. Looking down here, you can tell how this, the front splitter, it goes back in. The front splitter on my R, it kind of comes out in the corners. It really just points out this way. But the good thing about this is that since it goes back in, it makes it really easy angulating the car and not bottoming out on front dips. I feel like the front end itself, it's way higher. You can kind of see how it goes up. I actually never ever worry about bottoming this thing out because it's just that easy to drive. Obviously, if you go on head on to a big dip, you're probably gonna bottom out. But as long as you're reasonably careful and you know what you're doing, it's it's a really easy car to drive. One major point of concern though is that of the rain tray that's under this front vent. So I did remove it. I'll show you what it looks like right now with it removed. It takes some time to do it, but here we go. The hood latch is right here, popping that. It's nice too because with the, the the 500, you have white accents all throughout the car. So right here on the door, this is leather right here. The seats, you have the white accents. A few of you guys pointed this out, but the seats themselves, they kind of show the outline of a Cobra, which is pretty cool. If you look right there, right, that outline on the edge of the Cobra. Now, now look at the seats, right? It, it does look alike. You'll also find more white accents right here next to the center console, and white stitching with a white accent right there on the top of the wheel. As you guys know, one of the coolest features about it is that you put in these, you push in these pins. And there we go. And as you can see, with the front rain tray out, you can see directly out the other side. What's awesome about it is that when the hood is actually lowered and the sun is pointing, I'd say, the opposite direction, you can see the supercharger. Anyways, the point I'm trying to make is that there's about like 12 different bolts, one here, one there just wraps around the entire vent and it can get a bit tedious at times trying to remove that frame tray or put it back in depending on the weather. I'd say a good three to four times I did have to do that and man the process was a pretty tough when you actually forget where you keep those bolts, those screws and well I made it through it obviously but you really got to watch out with that. The content coming your way is going to be so awesome. It's already in the works right now. Uh, tomorrow's going to be a very exciting day. You'll see a quick teaser of it on Instagram. You're, you're going to love it. This is going to be basically our last normal video in the sense of me just showing the car to you. Let's go over a few things I learned about the car. But other than this, it's just going to be non-stop racing, which is, I've been looking forward to it, especially, for example, the road course. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but since this new GT500 has the hood strut right there, you no longer need that prop. They got to pick up and move over here and latch it in somewhere up here. What's weird about it though is that you still have the latch for that prop right there. So this exact carbon fiber composite piece right here is still shared with the GT350, but I guess with the 350s now, they have the cutouts for these, but with the new GT500, we still have this piece right here. Put some effort into it and drop it. Here we go, getting inside the 2020 GT500. Let's, uh, let's start it up. And look at that, not sure you guys noticed that, but we have the Cobras now with the GT500 puddle lamps. Strange thing is that if you do want to turn off this car and leave it in drive, 
Well, if you do that, this thing down here is like a robot. I, I learned this after driving this for so long now, but um, I guess I guess one of the times I forgot to put it in park, and watch what happens to the rotary dial gear selector. Crazy, right? Did you know it did that? I, I didn't realize that when I first got it, but this moves on its own. Even right now, I can't even move it. It's, it's completely locked in, and if you do forget to put it in park, or even you leave it in neutral or reverse, it'll automatically do it for you. Pretty cool if you ask me. I still kind of wish that Ford made a more sporty um, transmission gear selector because this is kind of kind of not cool when you turn it on and you spin it, but you get used to it. I got used to it and I just make sure to hit the end button right there in the middle and I'm, I'm all good to go. I just forget that I have that and I just consider that these are my manual gear levers and I just stick with them. I kind of wish there was a way to uh, make sure the car always starts off in loud mode, but I guess I can't do that because of maybe um, concerns with the exhaust passing emissions or stuff like that. If you find out a way to do that, please let me know because I would love to do it. Moving this way, hit the, uh, the Cobra right there. It opens up the performance menu. Going down to track apps. We have line lock. That's where I used line lock to do my 10 six quarter mile run. You hit hold OK to uh, initialize. And then the next step is that you put your foot to the floor. I'm not gonna do it right now because I don't wanna do a line lock burnout over here. Going this way, track apps, we have launch control. A few of you guys were asking me, what does launch control max out at? It seems like launch control goes all the way up to 3,200, I believe. Yep, I used 3,200 for my uh, 10 six quarter mile run. But for the street, let's try going down to maybe 1,400 the, the minimum. Um, 1300 would be pretty good, I think. Because, uh, as you know, the ground is not that sticky, not that grippy, I guess you could say. But acceleration timers, we have 0 to 30, 0 to 60, 0 to 100, eighth mile, quarter mile, then you can see your results. So my best time as of now, it's uh, 3.7, 0 to 60 uh, time. And brake performance, I've not done anything with that yet. I'm interested in finding out how well this car does brake, though. One thing I will use is on the racetrack, I'll use the lap timer function. And with this, I'm excited about it because everything is right here implemented in your screen. So no longer do I need a, a big solo DL data logger right here to give me a split times. I can just look down directly in the middle and it'll give me live action updates. It's really the perfect package, honestly. And yes, you probably saw I have 19 miles of gas left. It's okay, this thing pretty much eats up the gas, not as quickly as my uh, 500 Super Snake or my GT 350R, but it's still, it's a gas guzzler ride. You buy this kind of car, you don't complain about it, but if you do daily drive it, you are going to notice just how quickly it goes from a full tank to basically an empty tank. Speaking of daily driving though, a lot of you guys are asking me, how well do these seats feel? Are they comfortable? And you know what, for my size, they're perfect. I have no complaints with them. They, they hug you in very nicely. You're not going to go anywhere, especially in a corner. I think they're the same exact seats as in my uh, GT350, but these are just leather versus the, uh, the suede, I think it is, in my 350. It's a suede or Alcantara with cloth is, is a combo. Nonetheless, I love these seats. I would not buy this car without the seats, but I guess depending on your size, you could have some issues with it. But for me personally, it, they're awesome. I would definitely recommend it. Plus, they look pretty mean. It makes the entire car itself live up to the expectations, especially if you're walking by it. You'll see these nice, sporty, or racy Recaro seats. And here we are at the gas station. Just filled up, I think, three quarters of a tank. Let's turn on the car. Let's see how much gas we have. <laughs> that purple display is just so awesome. So, so right there, three quarters of a tank. Um, if you guys didn't know this, with the LCD display, you can customize the colors. So as you can tell, I've got purple as my primary, and then orange is my secondary. And the primary basically means that, like the RPMs, for example, the gas gauge, and even the, the average fuel economy is going to be your main color. So purple is the primary, and the secondary you can change to whatever you want. So right now, let's. Um, I'm feeling a bit of uh, green today. Scroll down to my color. You can change your primary and secondary. So let's change the secondary to green. Let's see what green looks like. Pretty cool, right? Reminds me of the bullet. But there we have it, green with purple. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys what it's like driving this car at nighttime. There's a bit of slippage right there, actually. I think the ground is just not in the, the best uh, shape right now. Why is there so many people? This is, this is California right here. So daily driving this car, this is what we got to deal with all the time. Tons of people, absolutely everywhere. You know, 
right there, full throttle in a corner, and the thing is just so planted. It's so much fun. Try it again right here. So downshift. Keep click and hold, it'll downshift you to the lowest possible gear. <laughs> Daily driving this. The, the best way to put it is that this is the best Mustang Shelby you can ever buy for daily driving. That's just my honest opinion. If you have the budget for it, and if you're interested in buying it, and you got a good deal on it, I think if you buy this, you would be super, super happy with it. And I know a few people actually buying this car in the track bag who are planning on daily driving it. Yes, they may, they may be taking off the carbon fiber wheels, but th this is such an easy car just to drive on the street. Nothing in this car actually requires you to manually operate it. It's all done automatic, automatically, really. And I know Ford says the DCT is not an automatic, it's, it's an automated manual. You can just leave it in auto mode and it'll shift for you. So that is, if you want to relax driving home from work, or if you want to drive long distances and get good gas mileage, it, it should do that for you. And like I said earlier in the past few videos, I've been getting 15 miles per gallon, which is very good for a car like this. 760 horsepower, the highest performing Mustang ever, and I get better gas mileage than the GT350, which can't even compete with this car, really. After driving 3,000 miles with this car, it just, well, when I first got into it, I wasn't sure how the journey was gonna unfold. Honestly, I wasn't sure if the car was gonna be worth the money, and when I first got it and drove it off the lot, it, it just clicked to me. This is going to be such a crazy road trip. It really will be. And while I was driving across the country, even at nighttime or just for nonstop hours at a time, the drive itself, it never got old to me, which is a pretty strange thing because driving nonstop just on a straightaway freeway for eight hours till the next destination, you, you'd get tired or bored or just get sick of it. In this, no, I didn't. I left it in automatic mode for a good portion, just to get good gas mileage. And when I want to have some fun, I just put my foot to the floor and it'll automatically downshift for you. It just, it knows what you want to do, I feel like. And just the sound it makes, it's one of those things, it just kept me going, it just kept me engaged. Even on the freeway driving nonstop, the ride, what was very surprising to me, this feels like the best riding Mustang I have ever ever been in. Comparing against my GT350, it's just in a different category to myself. My arm constantly kind of bumping, jumping around and getting bumped around. In this, it just feels comfortable, calming. It doesn't get you worried. It's not one of those cars that you get in and you feel intimidated by it. Even with the hood it's sitting in here, the hood is not that high up. It's pretty strange because what Ford managed to do is that they flip the supercharger upside down so that they can put it further into the V8, the V of the V8, and it allowed them to lower the hood itself. So sitting in here with my seat lowered to the ground, basically, it doesn't get in your way. It doesn't seem overly high, it doesn't seem overly long. It just seems fine. If anything, it's just really cool to look at. As a package itself, this has everything that you could be looking for in a Mustang. If you bought a Shelby GT350 and you're looking at it and going, well, okay, maybe I need more horsepower. It's not that quick on the straightaway for pulls or at the drag strip or even the straight lines of a racetrack. This car fulfills that need. It's got 760 horsepower, over 200 more than the GT350. And can a corner? Yeah, I can corner just as good as a GT350. What else could you be looking for in a Mustang? In my opinion, nothing. As a package itself, like I just said, this has got everything I'm looking for. A lot of people out there are looking at modding their new 2020 GT500. It makes me wonder what we're gonna see in the aftermarket field. It also kind of worries me because, put it this way, you guys saw what happened with the GT350s. Um, if you modded your engine and let's say it blew up, Ford has been really strict about warrantying your car. They, they're making sure now that if, if you've modified your vehicle, that they will not warranty it. So my fear is that when it comes to this, let's say that you did modify the engine or you modified the exhaust, change out the exhaust or get like headers, for example. What happens if something did go wrong and your warranty is now void? Well, this is the most expensive Mustang ever. It costs $80,000 for a, a well-equipped base model, I think with the handling package and the stripes and the technology package, like 82,000. With the uh, track pack, it goes up to 95 to 105 if you get the paint on the over the top stripes. If you do get this car and you modify it right away, but what if the reliability right out of the gate of Ford Motor Company is not so good and there are issues, and let's say your engine has a problem or your drivetrain or the DCT, will they 
actually comply and help you fix it. That's my thing. I don't know how that's going to play out. So modifying, let's say your supercharger changing, changing it out or getting a new tune, it, it could seem like a good idea right away. But if you look at the big picture, voiding the warranty in the most expensive Mustang ever, it could be a, um, a, a skeptical thing to do. Don't get me wrong. I will be modifying the new 2020 GT500 but just not in, in the same extent as my GT500 Super Slick, if that makes any sense. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure to hit that like button. It really has helped me out. And subscribe for much more great Shelly videos coming your way. We've got a ton of awesome races happening this next week, curated for nonstop content, and I'm super excited about it. Anyways, I'll see all of you in the next episode.